So thank you very much for the introduction, Matt. And uh, congratulations to all of you who maybe had a bit of a late night last night, so you've made it in for nine o'clock. I uh, hope you're not feeling too tender this morning. My name is Tim Paulden, and I am Link Governor for Curriculum and Outreach at Exeter Math School, and the Innovation and Development Manager at ATAS Sports. And my talk for you today is called Developing Rich and Fun Learning Activities Using R. Now, as the Mango guys now uh, know only all too well, I like to get a bit of wordplay or a pun into the title. And so uh, this year I've gone with uh, Shiny Happy People, which is a song, of course, by every data scientist's favourite band, R.E.M. <laughs> it doesn't get any better, I'm sorry. <laughs> so let me talk about the uh, affiliations. So uh, I work for ATAS Sports in Exeter. Uh, this is Oxygen House, which is our office. We do sports forecasting, so we're predicting the results of future sports matches. And we do predictions across uh, all sports, so football, horse racing, tennis, uh, you name it. If you follow it, we've got a model for it. And my particular role there is Innovation and Development Manager. And there's a few aspects to this. I sit between the research team and the, innovation, uh, the IT development team on technical innovation. Uh, but I also am in charge of training, which means I look after our summer internship programme. I do external workshops for PhD students and uh, undergraduate students, and I look after new starters. And before I started at ATAS, in between my maths masters and PhD, I actually did a teaching year, a PGCE, in secondary and sixth form mathematics. And that brings me to Exeter Maths School, where I'm a governor. I've been a governor there for about four years, and I've just renewed for another four years. I must be mad. And uh, let me just tell you a bit about Exeter Math School if you're not aware of what it does. This is a state-funded uh, math specialist sixth form. There's only two in the country. They opened in 2014. One's in Exeter and one is King's College London. Uh, it's sponsored by Exeter University and Exeter College. This sponsorship by university is a common feature of all these math schools. It's Ofsted Outstanding. And importantly, it's not just for uh, high-flying straight-A students. It's for those who are deemed to have high maths potential. And when I learned this, this was the thing that really wanted, uh, made me want to get involved with uh, the school. And they run this extra mathematics certificate, which I spoke about uh, two years ago, very briefly, uh, when I spoke at Earl. And this includes analytics projects set by industry. So we contribute a project on predicting the premiership. Um, there's projects from Dyson, the Met Office, the Hydrographic Office, and so on. So I'll come back to that aspect very briefly a bit later. But Extra Math School acts as a kind of hub for school maths activity in the region. And on the programming tech front, a couple of things that I just wanted to chuck in. The students study programming every fortnight. That's uh, across the board. So if you're one of the students there, then uh, you have programming in R and Python. We have R and Excel integrated into stats lessons and homework, and R is being used for grade predictions as well. So uh, we've got an ongoing modelling project to try and build the best predictive model we can based on the students' uh, past information, which is kind of cool. We're very proud that the school was named Sunday Times Sixth Form College of the Year last November, so they still hold the title uh, at this moment in time. And uh, we're also proud that uh, despite having a stellar run of results the last few years, the kids actually managed to top it last month. So everyone was very proud of them. OK, so it's appropriate, as Matt said, that um, this keynote is attached to the Data for Good Lightning talks. Because when I came back from sabbatical uh, a little earlier this year, uh, I decided that I wanted to give something back. And in particular, to address this question, can I use what I know to make a difference, at least in my tiny little corner of the world uh, there in Exeter? And an area of focus that's always been uh, one of my passions is higher order thinking in maths and statistics. And in particular, it's summed up by these three questions here. Uh, can we design enjoyable activities to promote higher order thinking in maths and stats? Are there advantages to underpinning with technology um, obviously linking quite nicely to my day job. And, of course, can R and Shiny play a leading role? Now, I think higher order thinking is going to become increasingly important going into the future. It's less than four months till we're all living in the 2020s, which is kind of a crazy thought. 
And a child, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and a, a child born today uh, will be celebrating her 21st birthday on the opening day of Earl 2040. So by that point, how far will AI and automation have come? And what skills is she going to need to thrive? I would argue that higher order thinking is always going to be at least part of the solution. So here's my game plan. Um, and this was over the last couple of months and just in my volunteer volunteering time. Um, I should have said that as a result of coming back off sabbatical, I decided to uh, go part time at work. So reduce my hours and to put time into this as a voluntary activity. So I'm going to research rich activities. These are activities that have these higher order thinking skills. This is the name given to them in the uh, math education literature. I'm going to make some new activities with some tech. I'm going to deliver them to three year 10 groups who are visiting on a summer residential. So lucky them. <laughs> and uh, there's going to be 90 students in total, three groups of 30. I'm going to present the ideas at Earl in uh, September 2019. So here we are. And uh, after this, definitely have a beer and evaluate and consider what we're going to do next. OK, so this isn't a maths education conference, uh, so I'm not going to dive into too much detail on this stuff. But a rich activity in the mathematics literature, you can think of as like a maths investigation. You might remember these from school, these sort of investigations where you're not just uh, answering a sequence of exercises, but it's open-ended in some way. So if you just read through quickly these properties, this is what the literature says a rich activity involves. And just to pick out a couple of the key points, it's challenging for learners working at all levels. So people can get into the activity easily, but then whatever level they're at, they will find a challenge somewhere. And uh, secondly, uh, I like to emphasize this idea, the opportunity for surprise. As you go through a rich activity, at some point there should be a, ooh, kind of moment, yeah? I didn't realize that was going to happen. Uh, and so we're really talking about mathematical exploration here, not what I had at school and what I'm sure many of you guys had, which was do all the odd-numbered exercises, okay? So there's a real difference in the nature of the activity. In the course of my research, I stumbled upon this book, which came out last year. If you're interested in this stuff, you must read this book, okay? Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. I've heard about it through about three different channels now. Um, uh, Craig Barton, How I Wish I Taught Maths. And it's from this book that the following diagram comes. So this is classifying different types of activities. The rich activities I just talked about, you'll see are these top two, where it has a high level of independent problem solving. And the routine exercises do all the odd numbers, uh, these ones here, routine exercises. Okay? Now, when I did my uh, teaching year, uh, quite a few years ago now, um, if you had a rich activity, it was synonymous with the top left, open-ended problem solving investigation. And hopefully, you all kind of know the kind of activity that I'm talking about. In the last couple of years, this, this is the new kid on the block, yeah? Purposeful practice. And the idea is to combine the high opportunity for independent problem solving with development of fluency. So this is only the last couple of years. So this is fairly cutting edge in terms of the, uh, what's, been doing, what's happening in the literature. So I really wanted to emphasize what this is. I think it's a really interesting idea. Uh, purposeful practice is a rich task where attention is directed onto a certain routine skill. And the idea is that students are going to practice that skill within a broader problem-solving framework. Okay? So that's going to give them some motivation. It's going to stop it being boring. And you can think of it as gamifying uh, the activity. They're also called mathematical etudes, if you ask uh, Colin Foster. And one of the best examples, and it's a statistical example, is a Venn diagram task. So I'm just going to show that as an example. We've got a Venn diagram here with three regions, and each region has a condition. So, for example, the blue circle is median greater than range, and so on. And the task is, uh, the student is asked, can you think of a set of three numbers, uh, set five numbers rather, that could belong in each region? So, come up with a set of five numbers. Where does that live in this space? So, for example, if we were not particularly creative and we came up with one, 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 then it would live there. Okay? And the follow-up question is, if you think a region is impossible to fill, convince me why. So I think this is a really nice example of activity uh, to, to test this, this kind of thinking, because you can actually fill in all, of, all the regions. It's possible if you experiment. But hopefully it's obvious that doing an activity like this 
is going to get the students engaging with the concepts of mean, mode, median, range. And it's going to have them doing a lot of those calculations as well on sets of five numbers. But they're not just going through a long, long list. They're having to think creatively about what's going on. How are they going to tailor their set of five numbers to fit in a particular box? So if you think about this, if you wanted the mean to be greater than the median, just you guys in the room, what kind of thing would you be thinking of? You'd be thinking of, well, I want maybe a really high number in there to bump up the mean, because I know that's the behavior I'm going to see. Okay? So this is like a, a kind of recommended purposeful practice activity. And I think there is an implication here for training in industry. I had to think about this, obviously, it being a, an enterprise uh, conference. Uh, how does this fit in exactly with industry? Because I do a lot of training myself. And I think it is relevant. And an illustration that I would give is a low richness task in the context of training would probably be something like perform this data analysis and check you get the right result. And I would argue that a high richness version of that same task would look more like this. How different would your input data set need to look for you to alter the results or the conclusion? Okay? So you're thinking a lot more reflectively and a lot more deeply about what's going on rather than just the mechanics of it. So just have this picture in your mind uh, sort of going forward that we have these uh, high level tasks, these rich tasks, and uh, that they're really important. Okay, so on to, on to the next part. So my thesis today for you guys uh, is the following, which is so important it appears in a box. So my idea is that if you can provide a well-designed, that there's a lot in that, <laughs> that double barrel word actually, if you can provide a well-designed technological underpinning to a rich activity, what, what that's going to do is accelerate the low-level mechanics and immediately, exponentially enhance the higher order thinking and reasoning that's going on. Okay? And I'm going to call this expedited insight. There may be another term in the literature, but we're going to go with this uh, for the purposes of today. So just to set the scene, we've been talking quite abstractly so far. I just want to give a couple of our examples. And these first two were learning activities I developed back in 2016. There's the hit the target game and the crack the code game. I originally ran them with year seven and year eight. And if you've got kids that you want to get interested in R, um, yeah, lucky them again, uh, or friends' kids, uh, then you can just open up an R session, do the hit the target game, and uh, you, know, you don't need anything else. So, uh, how do they work? So, the hit the target game, uh, this is the set of instructions that I give out to the kids, and we'll sort of step through them. And have a think about what the mathematics is behind this, and, and what the thought process would be if you were a teenager uh, engaging with this activity, rather than someone who knows a lot of R already. Okay, so type the command sum 3 colon 5 into R. What's the answer and why? Try out a few of the positive whole numbers in place of 3 and 5. The numbers must be different. Which two numbers give you an answer of 29? How about 24? How about 38? Set a target number for the pair sitting next to you. Can you suggest a strategy to solve these? Are there any target numbers you can't make? Okay. So we're talking about sums of consecutive numbers here. And we're going to um, underpin it with R. So first of all, really accessible entry point. It's very easy to understand that sum of 3 colon 5 is 12. And this is a really clear compact notation. Okay? There's nothing uh, redundant about it. Okay? So it's very easy for the kids to understand what's going on. And let's look at some of the mathematical patterns that emerge. This might happen over the course of 40, 45 minutes if you're doing it with a class. Um, unfortunately, we haven't got that amount of time now. But uh, if you want to kind of uh, take it away and have a go at it yourself, you'll be able to uh, back up what I'm saying here. So two consecutive numbers, sum them up, is always going to give an odd number. There's some illustrations here. And if you want to make a particular odd number, you can halve the target and take the number either side. So that's one of the patterns that emerges quite quickly. It's quite accessible extends to three in a row. So three consecutive numbers is a multiple of three. And again, by picking the middle number correctly, you can make any such multiple of three. Four in a row. Uh, actually, the sum of four numbers in a row aren't multiples of four, like you might think. They're semi-multiples of four. In other words, they're in between. But you can, again, make any such number by following a rule. Okay? So going back to the original slide, uh, here, 12 is the answer to the first part. If we wanted to make 29, we could say 14 and 15. 
24 would be 7, 8, 9, 38 would be 8, 9, 10, 11, okay? And obviously, this is kind of infinitely extensible, because I could say, okay, how, how would you make uh, 1,234, or some number off the top of my head, how do you make that number, okay? And there's different rules that come into play, and you want a general strategy. And uh, what I really like about this task is, uh, I guess, a little element of surprise. This certainly wasn't obvious to me when I first picked it up, or even if, after I've worked with it for a while. But uh, this final question, are there any target numbers you can't make? It's all the powers of two, and precisely the powers of two. And it's not obvious at all why that is when you first look at the question. It sort of is emergent from the analysis. And I would say that to prove that this is the case in a sort of proper rigorous way would probably be on the level of a first year undergraduate rather than someone who's 12, okay? So this is uh, a very extensible task. You can sort of give it to anyone in that range and they will be able to get something out of it. It's a rich activity. A couple of quick observations. So uh, R is allowing students to experiment efficiently without what I'm going to call <laughs> called drudgery, okay? Now those examples when you're adding up two, three, four consecutive numbers, you can do that by hand very easily. But consider that some of the ones you're want to, wanting to do here might be a string of a thousand consecutive numbers, okay? Now we could probably do that because we've got a closed formula for it, but it's important for the students to be able to do the calculation on the original data quickly without any fuss, okay? And that's going to allow us to shift the focus to the higher order thinking. So what's actually going on here? Again, expedited insight. And I think this has been a theme throughout the conference, of course, but choosing the right tool for the job is critical, okay? This uh, formula, sum x colon y, I would call obscenely compact, okay? Because it couldn't be any simpler for the pupils to type. And I think that just makes it very easy and attractive. There's no overhead, okay? And also, importantly, this represents how you would do the calculation in practice. So it's not contrived. You're teaching them how to use an R function on an input. It would flounder in Excel, and uh, I'm absolutely certain about this because uh, you need to, as a, if you think about a blank spreadsheet, what you need to do, you need to sum over a varying number of cells and you need to define an increment rule. And actually just the action of defining an increment rule to get adjacent numbers is a difficult task for uh, many teenagers in a spreadsheet. Okay, so on to the crack the code game, the uh, second R game, and we're going to be talking about shiny in a second. So in this game, students are given the text of a book, uh, let's say 60,000 words, and it's been encrypted with a substitution cipher. And they need to decrypt it using R with the aid of some helper functions. And this illustrates two things. The data that we reason about can be words or letters rather than numbers. And there's also a valuable tie into literacy. As long as you can get hold of the electronic text of a book, you can run this activity with any book you want, or indeed any text you want. So we can't, again, dive deep due to reasons of time, but I'm going to give you a flavor. Let's suppose that we take all these encrypted words and the students run the R function, and it tells them that the top, top 10 most common words are as shown there, okay? Now, very easily, having a little eyeball at that, the students say, well, word two is and, because that's consistent with word four being a. It's like, okay, so we'll fill that in. And there's a function that allows them to do the replacements. And then they say, okay, well, word five, that's I. I know that. Word one is the, because that's consistent with nine being that. Fantastic, so we can fill that in. Word six is two. And we reach a situation something like this, okay? So just by looking at the most frequent words, they get somewhere, they get a starting point. And then at the next step, we sort of have a talk about this uh, word number three. So is this of? Or is this or? I mean, it could be ox, but that would be a bit of a weird book, right? <laughs> um, so how are we going to determine what that is? Well, there's a separate function that allows you to take a pattern and search for it. So if I take the pattern capital X and search for it, these are my top four hits. Looking at that fourth one, it's very clear that the X is an F, the V is an R, and the A is an M. And by following this sort of algorithm, going all the way through, they can solve the entire book in about 25 minutes and find out that I've given them the War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Okay. So they really love this activity. There's a lot of thought. There's a lot of reasoning going on. But the only reason it's working is because we're giving them support functions. And this is particularly important for young students. These functions are going to handle contingencies as well. So for example, each code letter must have a unique mapping. Okay? And you don't want a situation where they can sort of get themselves into a situation where they can't get back because they've double mapped a letter. 
So it has to check for that. They might want to undo. They might want to go, I've, I've, I put ox. I'm sorry, this is an absolute. <laughs> I've got to roll back. Yeah? So it has to support that. And the general question of these activities is how much should we scaffold them? How much should we help with functions? And the final point on this, students are interacting. I mean, I'm gonna, I put large data. I mean, obviously, this is tiny, right? But 60,000 words, a data set of 60,000 is gargantuan for a classroom, OK? And students are interacting with that data and they're finding genuine statistical patterns. The data is large enough so that those patterns are emergent, and so it's not contrived. And I think that's important. Okay, so uh, as per the title, uh, enter Shiny. So it's been talked about a lot of times already during the conference, so I will be brief on justifying this choice. Uh, but you get a much richer interactivity with Shiny than a standard R session, and it's reactive. Uh, as you adjust the input, the outputs automatically change instantly. So I decided I'm going to use Shiny for all of these August sessions. And uh, I had a look in the literature to see what people have said about using Shiny. There's a lot of undergraduate examples. There's one or two school examples. Here's a sort of sample of five uh, papers that I found quite useful. And the main takeaways from these are uh, summarized by the following. So, in different words, the papers say continuous interaction is valuable, okay? So rather than having discrete changes via an input, you've got sliders, okay? So you can see dynamically things changing. How much support and scaffolding do you provide to students? The literature says provide, <laughs> make sure you've got enough, uh, otherwise they can sort of flounder a bit. Make the layout uncluttered and consistent. Run it locally if you have student activities, uh, if you think there's ever going to be a problem with a large group connecting. I mean, technology in schools, uh, there's lots of issues around that. Uh, and finally, for fast simulations, imagine a teacher trying to write one of these activities. Make sure they know about vectorization or efficient coding, otherwise simulation activities are just going to fall flat on their face. Okay? So they were sort of the main takeaways. And I also looked in the maths education literature and these are some of the things that come out as important. Uh, so I'll just briefly mention them. Not just diving into the tech, emphasizing links between the tech and pen and paper, uh, allowing mutualization, so discussion, uh, like final class discussion on highlights, socialization, working in pairs. This is a really important one, managing the novelty. So don't introduce a new idea, a new concept, at the same time as new technology. It's too much. So stagger them in some way. And finally, develop a pre-prepared computer file and a worksheet alongside it, OK? Obviously, Shiny is going to play the role of that pre-prepared file. But what this means is don't just give them a blank Excel sheet and go, right, guys, this is the activity. You need to plan it in advance. And I did three 90-minute sessions uh, in the second half of August. It will not have escaped you that that wasn't very long ago, so this is all very fresh. And uh, the session title was uh, as shown. It's a game of two halves, combining maths and coding to predict football. And these were the five main uh, shiny apps that I ran. Uh, Wembley, in the second one, is a board game, not the venue. Okay? I do have some thoughts on how you'd improve the actual venue Wembley. OK, so uh, just a couple of photos to give you a flavor. We had three groups of 30. And, uh, as the tech has been so fantastic over the last couple of days, uh, I'm going to try and, uh, try and do something a bit new. So rather than do a live demo, uh, I'm going to step through some screen captured videos to give you a flavor of the activities that we did in the session. OK, so these were captured by me afterwards. They weren't like live recordings of the students or anything like that. So uh, yeah, let's cross our fingers. <laughs> so, uh, so activity one I call Dice Battle. Okay? And this is foreshadowing the idea of win, draw, loss in a sports fixture, like a football match. So the simplest example I could think of was that, of that was two dice being rolled against each other where they have different numbers. Okay? So I tee up with pen and paper because I follow the maths education literature. So uh, consider rolling a super dice, which I, the name I've given to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, against a normal dice. What's the chance of each one winning or a draw? And you get these answers here if you do it on paper. Okay? I then introduce the shiny, and the students use it to first of all check the answer, and then to do an investigation that I came up with. And this investigation is into dice with 21 spots, and I tried to design it to be a rich activity. Uh, you'll see in a moment how it works. But uh, a normal dice has 21 spots on it. We've seen from the above that a dice with 27 spots can beat a standard dice. 
is it possible to, have, to design a dice with 21 spots that can beat a normal dice so it has a higher probability of winning? Okay, so this was the activity. Let's go. Don't worry about that, we got that before. <laughs> okay, so dice A is the standard dice. Dice B is the one that we're designing. So the first stage is to check that if we run a uh, super dice, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that we get the answers claimed. And indeed we do. The numbers come here, you get a visual comparison. Yellow indicates the highest bar. And then they started experimenting with dice with 21 spots in total. So that means that sum of B is going to say 21. So by playing with the sliders, they're going to investigate different dice that have a sum of 21. And you might think, what kind of strategy would you follow for this? Uh, when you see two yellow bars, it means they're obviously the same size, so you've only achieved a draw against the standard dice. So we can flip, flip, uh, flip through a few different possibilities. This dice adds up to 21, and it's a draw. And you, know, you might experiment and play with a few other possibilities. Again, we get a draw with 21. So you might think, well, OK, let's try something a bit different. Let's try putting a high number on the dice. Let's try putting, let's say, a 7 on the dice. So we need to make room for it. We create a 7, and we find out now actually we're losing, and dice A is winning. Dice A has got a higher win probability. And obviously, it's not going to help if we make it an 8 or a 9, because it doesn't matter how much we win by. Yeah, the standard dice only has a 6. So that's not helping us at all. In fact, we're just falling further behind. So let's sort of reset and uh, think about this a little bit differently. If we tried numbers at the high end, and they didn't really help us, maybe we could try numbers at the low end. So it turns out that if you put a zero on one of the faces and transfer the spot somewhere else, as shown, suddenly we are winning. We're ahead of the standard dice for the first time. And this principle holds again if we give ourselves another zero and transfer the spot elsewhere. And now we're winning by, it's 21, yeah? and now we're winning by two out of 36, okay? And there's multiple solutions that achieve this. There's not just one. The student's favorite solution was 003666. A lot of them hit this solution. Then you might think, well, why is this actually happening? And the student, one of the students in particular gave a really excellent explanation, which was, consider the following dice, 111666. That adds up to 21. Those ones can never win. It's impossible. So we're better off making them into zeros and using the spots elsewhere where we can win. So you notice here, the probability of B winning is 1536, regardless of whether we have a zero or one on that face. It's the draw that changes. So let's make it a zero and reassign the spot elsewhere. And then we have a gain over dice A. Let's do it again, move that one down to zero, move it up to three, and again, we have an even greater gain. Okay, so how long would that have taken if we'd have to have drawn out every single dice? Yeah. So the question now is, can we beat this dice? Okay, that was the, the follow-up question. Can we beat the dice we've just made? And in fact, we can, with a bit of experimentation. Uh, if we change dice A to be, let's say, three zeros and three sevens, uh, it completely crushes dice B now, okay? And uh, can we continue? Can we beat dice A? Well, a bit of experimentation shows we can. Let's stick a bunch of ones on there, and a couple of eights, and I think we have one spot left over, and we can maybe just add it here. And again, I mean, this is absolutely dominating dice A now. And we'll just do one, one more uh, iteration. Can we beat one, 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 two, eight, eight? Well, let's have three, 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 <laughs> three, and six. And dice is winning. So what this actually illustrates is a property that I didn't even realize before I picked up the, sh the shiny app uh, for dice, which is that dice with 21 spots are pathologically non-transitive, all right? And non-transitive means if A beats B and B beats C, it's not necessarily the case that A beats C. It's perfectly possible for C to beat A. You can actually buy non-transitive dice, like special sets that have been designed. But what's amazing is that this feature has just been right in front of us on normal dice the entire time, okay? And I didn't realize this existed, and neither did any of my colleagues uh, until we uh, brought up the shiny and started experimenting. Okay, so that's the dice battle. Then on to improving Wembley. Now, as its name suggests, the Wembley board game uh, is about the FA Cup. And you roll one of six different dice to determine how many goals a team scores in a match. I'll give you two examples here. Uh, the, the notation is kind of old school, so it's first division is the very top level. Okay? So first division team at home gets this red dice. First division team away gets this second dice. And you can see that the home has a slight advantage over the away. Just to sort of fix the idea in your mind, that's what the game looks like. You can see the six dice 
uh, for the game in the middle, uh, reds on the left and the oranges there on the right. So the question I asked them was, well, can I give, if I give you some real data, can you tell me what numbers should be on the dice? Because these are pretty high, right? It's, there's not a one in three chance that you're gonna score four goals. Yeah? Anyone who follows football knows that's true. So can we use real data to inform what numbers should go on these dice? And we probably want to stick to the constraint that it's you know, whole numbers yeah, on the dice. So what's the best configuration for them? Okay, so this required some real data. So let's play the video. Okay, so first of all, for this app, I wanted to note these display settings. So you, with these settings, you can alter the bar width, you can alter the uh, X, uh, just showing different bar widths there, you can alter the X range and the Y scaling, and uh, even the gap width. Now, this may seem, tr seem trivial, but the kids really like being able to zoom into certain areas and you know, to customize the display rather than being told that's what you have to look at. Okay, so the red is the real data, the probability of each score, zero, one, two, three, four. The purple represents the dice. You can see, obviously, it's six blocks of one sixth. And as they change the sliders now, these blocks of probability are gonna move around. And you might think of what solution, you might see if you agree with the solution they come up with. But most kids sort of drag these bars across uh, you can see the mean updating as well. So you've got the mean goal scored for the data, 1.53. For the dice, it's uh, well, coming down, it's now 1.5. So most kids came up with this solution here, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3. Really, really close match to the data in terms of the distribution and in terms of the mean. Away goals, quite different in terms of the distribution. Looks a bit like that. The red's the genuine data, and we can see a much better fit is 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3. And again, we get actually... Kind of coincidentally, there's no reason why we necessarily should get this, but we get a very close match to the mean. Okay. Now, from speaking to one of the teachers, I actually added an extra stage to this activity. So the kids did that, and then they did the same again, but slightly modified. Because we decided it would be a useful activity to experiment with adding metrics in, okay? Uh, remember these kids are sort of 14, 15, okay? Um, can we, uh, we asked them, can you suggest a simple way we can measure how close the dice probabilities are to the real probabilities? So you've got this model of reality. How good is it? And we decided this was a question worth asking. We suggested it. Um, they came up with the absolute error metric, kind of off the top of their heads, yeah? Obviously, just add up the gaps, right? And they're not able to use the right language, but they know what they're doing. We said, that's a fantastic idea. We're going to do that. In addition, we're going to use this squared error metric as an additional criterion because that's really widely used. So we introduced both. And they explored it using the metrics. So if we fire the video up. OK, so very much the same as before, uh, although we have absolute error and some of squared error showing here. In, in addition, in this plot, we have lines indicating the, the errors, as we call them here. And they're going to move dynamically in response to things being dragged around. So the kids can just visually see you know, exactly what's going on in terms of those gaps and how those are being combined to create those numbers. And so I've just uh, quickly recreated what they found to be the, the best uh, dice. Uh, we again see the means match, and we can see these errors are relatively small everywhere. Uh, one group suggested having two zeros rather than two twos, but we could see that that gave a worse score, and it also was worse in terms of the mean. And just quickly, we can do it for the away as well. And that was 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3. And you can see this is the best you can do. You can have a play around. But they've got a kind of goal now. They've got a metric that they are fitting on. Quite an advanced idea, obviously. OK. So if anyone's done any sports modeling, you'll know that the Poisson distribution is fundamental to football scores. You can't really pick up a... Uh, modeling paper on football or type something into Google uh, about football modeling without seeing the word Poisson. And again, it's quite a hard idea for people of that age, but let's go for it. So uh, we basically, I introduced the concept of the Poisson from the front. I had a good think about how to introduce it in terms of the formula. I did an iterative formulation. So how the probability of getting zero and then one, two, three, how they behave rather than a closed form. And they, they seem to understand that quite well. They were then asked to find by eye the uh, appropriate Poisson parameter corresponding to the home and away data. So this time, the red is still the data, 
and the purple is now the Poisson. And they've never played around with the Poisson before. So imagine you're meeting this for the first time. All right? So with this single slider, they can change the value of A, which is the Poisson mean. As they move it all the way to the right, you can see you get the characteristic shape, but it's well away from the data. Conversely, obviously, they like, they like trying to break things, right? So move it all the way to the left, and all the probability is then stacked up at zero. And there's a sort of Goldilocks point in the middle. And for the home data, it's about 1.48, 1.49. Where, as you can see, you get an amazingly nice fit between real data and the Poisson distribution. So maybe you guys didn't even realize this. If you've never looked into football modeling, you might not have put football and Poisson together as ideas. But let's do it for a way as well. Uh, same principle holds about 1.08 in this case, and you get a really nice fit to the global distribution of goals. Okay, so you can also, I should mention that they can alter the settings, like the, the range, if they want to play around. So I haven't talked about that for a while, but they can customize this plot and sort of zoom in and zoom out. Adding in these metrics that we said before, it's an advanced idea, but it did allow a firm conclusion. And this is why I'm very grateful to the teacher for suggesting it. I thought it was probably too advanced with everything else going on. But uh, if you look here, this, these are the uh, values that come out. So this was the DICE model, and this was the Poisson model. So you can see for home, it's much, much better, smaller errors. And the same for away. This is the uh, DICE model, this is the Poisson model. Okay, so that principle is really being reinforced, and they're finding it themselves. And this is just an example of uh, one of the uh, kids on the, working on the worksheet. I sort of structured it so there wasn't a lot of writing on the worksheet. They were just sort of filling in boxes. They seemed to like that. And we could refer to things by letters and things like this. But yeah, closer to actual values. There's, that's the sum of absolute errors, sum of squared errors. So the final football activity was on uh, predicting results. And I focused on a particular match, which is uh, Brighton versus Man City in May 2019. So very end of the season. And I gave students six model parameters associated with the match, and they had to figure out through exploring what the app was doing with those parameters. Okay, so this is like flipping the activity backwards and saying, you know, all the, all the previous activities have been kind of more, more structured. But with this, I'm not telling them how the app works. They have to work it out. Okay. Just in case you can't see these sliders, when we go to the video, maybe if you sat at the back, uh, the six sliders at the top show global average for home goals. So a home team scores this many on average. Uh, the same for away goals. The home team attack strength, so how many goals they score relative to the average. Yeah, higher is better. Away team attack strength. Home team defense weakness, how many goals they let in relative to the average. Higher is worse. And away team defense weakness. Okay, so just in case you can't see those, they are what the sliders say. So if we can roll the video. Okay, so by default, the home scoring rate and the away scoring rate are both equal to one, and they have a bunch of sliders at the top, okay? And if they alter the home goals, the average home goals, by moving it up to the value that we determined from the data, you can see that it comes as 1.58. This is just based on the last season. That's why it's slightly different to the value we had before. Same with away goals. If you move it up to 1.22, we see that that appears as the scoring rate. And these are the Poisson parameters we'd use if we had two teams that were completely average. Okay? But we know, in this case, it's Brighton versus Man City. So Brighton are at home. Their attack is worse than average. And we can quantify that by looking at their goals. The value we got out means that their home scoring rate reduces to about one. Man City are playing away. They're good at attacking, so we bump them up. And you can see that the away scoring rate goes up. And the relationship is actually multiplicative. And if they looked carefully, they would be able to uh, determine that from the sliders and their behavior. Uh, defense, Brighton's worse than average, Man City's a lot better than average. We put those numbers in, and uh, we get these final home scoring rates and these win probabilities. So if we could just pause at that point, if we just pause the video. The final stage of this is, these are the win probabilities uh, that are coming out of the model. The uh, kids had about 10, 15 minutes to sort of explore where they thought things were coming from, okay? The win probabilities, that they managed to get to the point where they said the win probabilities are coming out of the scoreline grid if you add up the appropriate regions. So, for example, the chance of a draw is nil-nil plus one-one plus two-two, yeah? Because if you add up all the possible draws, that gives you the overall draw probability. Similarly, for the home win, you add up all the stuff below the diagonal because they're all the home win scores and above the diagonal is the away win scores. So they managed to link this representation with this representation. 
And then some of the best ones got quite away, uh, actually with the aid of being able to scale it, because that allows you to read this plot a bit better, because you can scale and estimate what the values are. The values in this scoreline grid come from multiplying independently the Poisson distributions for the two teams. So to get a score of, let's say, 2-1, uh, so two goals to Brighton, one goal to Man City, that's the probability Brighton score two, which is uh, this number here, uh, multiplied by the probability that Man City score one, which is this number here. So if you can estimate those, which is another skill from that chart, you can confirm that that's where that's coming from. So this is very deep. There's lots of different stages to it, uh, but they're actually engaging with what is essentially a real football model. The only difference is when you get these home team attack strengths and defense strengths, uh, they don't just come from simple averages. They come from very, very much more complicated processes. And the final video, uh, this is a bonus activity. So uh, this was specifically requested by students. When I mentioned we did horse racing, uh, on the first set of feedback forms, they said, uh, can we do a horse racing activity? <laughs> so I said, OK. So they didn't benefit, benefit from it, but the other two groups did. Uh, so this has got a bit of a twist. I think this has got potential to become a fully fledged activity. So if we can just run the video. So horse racing hat on, OK? We have a grey horse, and its speed is somewhere between 40 and 56 kilometres per hour, uniformly distributed in that range. And we have a brown horse. Its speed is 45 to 55 kilometres per hour, again, uniformly distributed. So that means that the average speed of the grey horse is 48, as illustrated here, and the average speed of the brown horse is 50, as illustrated here. And the horizontal lines show the range. So we can run a uh, simulation of the race by clicking the Run button, and a point is generated randomly along each line. Here we find that the grey horse was the winner, and that's marked in blue because it had a higher value along that line. So it's a very, very simple model. We're saying we're generating according to a certain distribution, and the higher of the values is the winner. You can see how we can extend this. And each time you run it, you just get one result. So let's go up to the top and say we're going to do 1,000 repeats rather than just one. And we click the button. And this time, you just see the winners. So you see the winning blue lines. And you can see that the brown horse won just over 600 times out of 1,000. And you run it a few times, and this number's somewhere between 600 and 700 due to random variation. But you get your sense that the brown horse is definitely stronger, which makes sense because it's got a better average. Okay? And we can run that a few times. But the twist, where things start to go a bit crazy, let's say we don't just have these two horses. Let's say we've got one grey horse and we've got nine brown horses. Now the grey horse is the favourite. The grey horse is winning more times than any other horse, as shown by the simulation. And I can rerun it, and it's done it again. And, it's, and it won't do it every time. Occasionally there'll be another horse that just wins uh, more times by random chance. But most of the time, it's the grey horse that's winning. There's a random one. Okay. But most of the time, the grey horse is winning. So how can those two things both simultaneously be true? That the grey horse is better in a race of 10 against nine brown horses, but if we make it a one-on-one, -on -one, it's worse. Now, those of you who've got a bit of a maths background, maybe, or have seen something similar, you've probably got an idea of what the answer is and why this works. But my question would be, how would you explain that to a 14-year-old? Or how would you get them to come up with it? So just the last uh, couple of slides from me. So. 95% of students uh, enjoyed using Shiny based on their written feedback. I always get them to give an evaluation at the end. When we go to questions, I'll show some, of the, some photos of the feedback so you can sort of read some of it for yourself. It's quite interesting. Uh, some came up afterwards and said, how do I make one? <laughs> how do I make one of these Shinies myself? Uh, the main negative was actually uh, that came back, and this is really, really uh, stark, was overemphasis on football, okay? Um, which is interesting, actually. Um, adding the horse racing act into the horse racing interactivity uh, into session three rather was really well received. Okay, so that's something for me to definitely think about. How do we either transfer the context to a different sport or give a mixture of sports within that uh, session? Uh, positive teacher feedback, a lot of higher order reasoning going on during the mutualization. That's when we talked through everything, and we covered a lot. Hopefully, you'll agree that I mean I haven't covered everything we did, right? But that's a lot to do in an hour and a half, right? Okay, but they did it, and they got all of it, and they understood. And I wonder whether that would be the case if we hadn't have had the tech underpinning to everything. So my evaluation, uh, before I tell you how you can maybe get involved in this, my evaluation of this is that expedited insight was really widely evident, 
And you could tell that from the student dialogue and from what the teachers were saying. This means that the activities are opening up opportunities for this higher order thinking. We've seen those through all of the activities I've shown videos of. The key advantages of this solution are, first of all, it's completely free of charge. Now, to a school or to a parent, that's important, okay? You might think for some of the activities, well, I could do this a different way. Well, with this solution, you can do it free of charge. It's pretty simple to create or certainly to adapt an activity for an IT savvy teacher. I could give one of these activities to one of the teachers at the math school and they would be able to change it to something they wanted to do, no problem. And it's entirely customizable, Shiny. So this isn't common for teaching tools. Normally you're sort of stuck with the interface that the developer gives you. So the, the ability to just go, this is all they can see, is you know, really valuable. Uh, teaching feedback was excellent, the score metrics I've talked about, um, and the early indications are exciting. I'm going to talk about my next steps and how you can get involved before just finishing off. So I'm going to do some further development with other student groups. I've got sessions lined up with years uh, 7, 8, 9, 10 already, including year 10 residential, which is the same session that I did, but in a year's time. Engaging with the community, so there's a lot of people talking about education. This has just been over the last couple of months, so I haven't done much engagement with other people perhaps doing similar things, uh, but that is certainly on the agenda. And once it's evolved a bit, I'm going to be sharing everything online. In parallel with this, uh, this sort of student app development, I'm going to be looking into Shiny apps for teacher use specifically, and obviously the different considerations there. If you look at any of the Shiny papers, it talks about these obsolete Java apps uh, that have existed for ages uh, for statistics teaching, and they've sort of all crumbled and fallen apart um, and not, are not supported anymore. So there's probably some work to be done there in terms of what are we now missing that we used to have. And Colin Foster, the mathematical etudes uh, guy, I spoke with him on Monday about uh, potentially making these adaptive. So the point at which you switch from pen and paper uh, or a more uh, exercise-driven environment to the tech just completely supporting it, could that be adaptive based on how well the student's doing? And a lot of edutech companies are looking into this, of course. So a couple of ways you can get involved. If any of this stuff has been of interest to you, there's a few different ideas that I, that I wanted to suggest. So first of all, uh, become a STEM ambassador. It's uh, really easy to get trained and you can run activities in schools. You just need to wait for the background check to come through. If you're interested in running stuff in schools, um, you can go to stem.org.uk, STEM ambassadors. You can also get involved in a math school. I mentioned earlier that we did industrial projects with Exeter Math School and they, we've got a lot out of doing those. Now, Exeter and King's College London are already established, but Liverpool and Cambridge are in the pipeline, and it was announced in May that Surrey and Lancaster are uh, going to be coming a few, in a few years' time. So if you live in any of those areas, you, your company might want to think about getting involved in those analytical links. Uh, this project, which I'm sort of calling Shiny in Schools, uh, I'd like any ideas about activities, ideas, anyone who wants to spend some time maybe making shiny apps if you can't sort of go out into school, maybe you want to contribute that way, uh, or pass on information about what others are doing. Not in like a really creepy stalker way, I realized that uh, when I first wrote that, but just this is happening, are you aware of it? And uh, so if you're interested in this, if you want to keep in the loop, uh, please just drop me an email and this is my email address here. So I just wanted to finish off by um, mentioning this guy, who I'm sure almost all of you know, uh, Hans Rosling. Uh, you've all seen his YouTube videos. And I thought, as this was a session on uh, data for good coming up, um, it, was, it was really worth mentioning that you know, he's a professor of international health. He's the data viz pioneer. And I found all of his sort of interactivity and animations just you know, really inspirational. And many of you guys may not realize that he's also got this book that uh, came out last year. It's in paperback this year. It's called Factfulness, 10 Reasons We're Wrong About the World and Why Things Are Better Than You Think. Okay? Um, absolutely required reading. It would be my number one book recommendation for uh, anyone here. Uh, so uh, with your permission, I just wanted to put up a quote from him about the book and uh, a little animation that you might recognize from one of his TED Talks. Thank you very much.